Good morning, good morning. Welcome to a, another edition of our Voices of the Festival. I hope you're doing well. Uh, here we are. I started a new live video. And today we have two amazing composers. Uh, Mr. Billo already joined me. So, and God oh, bless Jay. Uh, perfect. Okay, let me invite them. So, uh, this is my call. And this is Jody. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, yeah. Hi, Michael. I'm, I'm inviting now uh, Jody. Perfect, both of you. Hey, good morning. Good morning. How are yeah. you, Boris? Oh, uh, there you, you are. Just, you were showing us the, the snowy scenery. No, no, because Michael, you are in. Uh, uh, you are in. Um, Florida, I am. Right? Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm playing okay, from Iowa weather. <laughs> That's, That's great. Really That's great. Hold on, let me, let me put it's not here. great right now. That's I know. That's what I hear. Because you normally are neighbors, actually. Yeah, we we live in the we live in the same well region of Iowa, and um, uh, yeah. yeah. But but. Right now, uh, so Michael, you are in Florida, specifically Miami. Right. And tell us, what are you doing there? Um, well, we just had a dress rehearsal of Johnny Skiki and um, my sequel, Woes of Ghost. And we had a uh, dress rehearsal last night. And we have uh, three performances in Miami on Saturday, Sunday, and Tuesday. We take a few days off, and then we do two more performances in Fort Lauderdale. Excellent. And congratulations. And uh, uh, yeah, must, you must be very proud to, to be leading your show, uh, Was It Both? Uh, no, Was It? Ghost. Uh, at um, Florida Grand, which is one of the big, wonderful companies in the country. And, yeah, it's very uh, exciting. And actually, you... you you were there before. I did. I was on the music staff here. Uh, it was my first job after the Houston Opera Studio program. And uh, so I, there are very, the phone number is the same, and that is about it. I, I have run across one or two or uh, people who uh, date from my era, but um, it's comparatively small. They, 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 they're in a different theater, a uh, different rehearsal space. Uh, and all that sort of thing. Right. Okay. So, but it's nice to to come back to. How long were you were you in in Miami then? I was there for four seasons, uh, and is it actually where I met Cheryl Mills? Good. Excellent. And, and Jody, yeah. where are you right now? Uh, I oh. am in Hubbard, Iowa. So I live just outside Ames. And it's snowing, so I didn't go into the office, so I'm at home. Good. All right. So well, hopefully it will be not too bad in the snow. Yeah, I know that you guys have a... We have another two days you know, of it, and then we get a break. Great. Good. Good, good. I, I, I heard that, that uh, last week was complicated with the snow, so... A little bit, yeah. Yeah, good, good, excellent. So, and um, and the reason why we are all met here is because, uh, first of all, you're very connected with with the Savannah Witch Festival, and the, and the Cheryl Mills program. Uh, in fact, we were all together last summer in Ames, uh, Iowa, in in our uh, studio and voice experience program. And uh, and you have been involved in working and composing for the festival. Um, Michael, you have done, I uh, think, four operas for us, uh, two full lengths and two short operas. And uh, and Jody, you, you wrote a song cycle for us. Uh, so and and the goal of of today, one of the things that we want to talk about, um, the big picture will be talking about uh, composing for the voice. But we're going to talk about you guys first and and your process and everything. So, but by the way, so Michael, um, how does it feel conducting your piece? Have you done? Have you conducted uh, Bosos Ghost before? Yeah. 
Yeah, I've done it uh, four or five times. And um, it's, uh, for me, enjoyable to conduct after the first time. Um, and um, as, as you know, um, you know, we had you conduct the um, premiere of, uh, of the, the birthday clown. And, and we had um, Andrew conduct the premiere of the double bill last summer. And so it's very important to me to have that composer perspective without mixing the conductor's perspective. I must say very humbly that every time I conduct Johnny Bozo's Goat, I realize that there are editorial errors that I need to fix. <laughs> and and this, this, piece is, this piece is from the 90s, and it's published very nicely, but I'm going to have to take the parts afterwards uh, and sit down them with with them for a day or so and fix some things that are are wrong. I mean, there there are a few things that are just blatant wrong notes, uh, uh, and then there are a few things that are just uh, kind of they're kind of the editorial things that you learn from conducting. That oh, uh, I should write a mezzo forte instead of a forte here, so that uh, the orchestra here doesn't cover the the stage. So, uh, but it's it, uh, and I think Jody, you probably agree with this that every the, the the whole notation process is very detailed, and it's just so easy to miss things every time. <laughs> right, I have that experience with every score too, and I think every opera has that experience, which is why when you buy a lot of opera scores, there's the page, right, the page of errata that they just kind of like tuck in. Um, to tell you where all the mistakes are because it's cheaper than re-engraving. Um, right. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, interesting that, that it's, a, it's a almost, uh, yeah, the proofreading is it's an endless process. In fact, I mean, we still get mistakes in, in pretty much every opera you ever encounter, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm doing Norma right now here in Tampa and I see different at least differences between the full score and the piano score and the vocal score and, and just, i don't know which one is is better uh, uh just, you couldn't say that oh this is this is the right one and that's the wrong one so it's just it will be a puzzle um great and so and uh, uh and why specifically uh, about the process why did you decide to write that piece uh, well, I guess uh, what happened was we were doing joint auditions in the 90s between the Chautauqua Opera, Opera Memphis, which I ran at that period of time, and this opera company here, the, the, the Greater Miami Opera, which is now called the Florida Grand Opera. And we were, we were having Having breakfast. I mean, we were having breakfast in Chicago before the auditions, and we were just shooting the breeze about what happens to operatic characters. Uh, you know, for example, um, we've announced our season next summer at Savannah, right? Uh, yes. So okay. if, if you're, you're going to do with Butterfly, right? Right. Right. So what happens, of course, to uh, the young to 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 uh the young boy what happens to it afterwards it's a it's a matter of speculation does he does he does he grow up uh happily uh is, is he raised is, is kate pinkerton a good mom <laughs> you know those are those are the kinds of questions that that run across your mind when 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 you think about the fate of operatic characters and so the skiki came up and we were all wondering what happened after johnny skiki and um, since Johnny, Johnny Skiki, in, in my opinion, is one of the only comic operas that is actually funny. Um, I mean, I, I love The Marriage of Figaro, and I love some operas that are, that are called comic. Uh, but perhaps 
with the other the uh, Barbara Seville is another example of a of a comic opera that is truly funny. But there there are really only a handful of them, uh, and I think the comic opera term is usually used to mean nobody dies. <laughs> and, and of course, the odd thing in Johnny Skeeky is, of course, it's about somebody who died, but it's a comedy. <laughs> so um, uh, that, but that's the origin story behind uh, Bozo's Ghost. And and as you know, we've 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 done the whole sequel thing in Savannah with the the royal feast sequel to La Cenerentola. So it's just it's just something that if if you don't worry as a writer too much about creating an individual style and you actually enjoy collaborating with the composers like Rossini or Puccini, um, then you're free to move ahead and have fun with that. Good. Now Good. I'm thinking about what else is on that list. I would put Old Maid on that list. I think that's a funny show. Which one? Uh, old Maid and the Thief. Okay. I, I don't know. I mean, I will certainly find Fausta funny. And, uh, and Plater Mouse? Plater Mouse is funny. Yeah. 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 Except that everyone is, it's a, you know, a bit of a bad character there. <laughs> it's, it's a certain it kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> funny. Yeah. Good. So, so the question is, uh, big question is, First of all, what's uh, uh, what are the, the? I assume there are the two cases of of, of um, genesis of of writing. Someone asks you to write, and then you decide to write. Uh, tell me, we're not going to do the, the. We're going to talk about the the easier one, which is someone asks you to write. So tell me, uh, how do you uh, have why and um, how would you ever start a, a composition just because you wanted to do it? Jolly, let's start with you. Uh, when, I, when I write without a specific singer in mind, which is not very often, uh, it's usually because I am inspired by the text that I'm about to set. And so my first, my first step is, oh, I really love this poem or this cycle of poems or this topic on which poems can be found. And then I go looking for a singer because I think it's, it's so much easier to write if you know what voice you're writing for. Okay. You can, you can ask way more specific questions. So, so the process will be you write some text and I say, oh, this is, this is music to my ears. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and then you decided to write a, a poem. Uh, right. And I assume there must be many cases in which you read something, but nothing happens right well, what sure yeah. meaning like oh this is a good text for for a piece yeah it goes, it goes on the wish list pile but it's okay. true that not everything in the wish list gets actually you know set to music and, and, and you know sometimes when people ask me to write something they will ask me to write but they don't have a text in mind so then that's that conversation happens and and i get to be sort of the you know, like one of the major forces in terms of, and then and then sometimes that's not the case. Um, like the uh, the opera, my opera that premiered in 2021, the company had a really clear idea of what they wanted and what they wanted the source material to be. And so I had a role in, in editing it down and figuring out what exactly I wanted to set, but the topic was set, so. Which, which one was that? What, what is it? And... What is, what's the topic? Well, uh, what was your opera? Uh, the opera is called Wailing Women, and it's W H A L I N G, not W A I L I N G. But they do wail at at least one point. But it, it was commissioned by Sea Glass Theater in Massachusetts, and they wanted they wanted a very nautical piece uh, about specifically about the role of women in the whaling industry in the middle 1800s, and they wanted to use uh, primary source for the libretto as much as possible. So there was a lot of research that went into it. I read a lot of books about the whaling industry and a lot, lots of them are journal entries or ship logs or letters, that kind of thing, newspaper articles. So uh, I, would, I would not probably personally have chosen, I, that wouldn't have been my first, my first thought 
um, in terms of writing a chamber opera. But once I got into the topic, I was very interested in it. Thank you very much. I mean, the, and uh, P. Cheeseman, thank you, uh, posted uh, the, the collection uh, about, you know, Wailing Women at Sigla Theatre Company. Thank you, thank you. And uh, lots of research on the Wailing Women. Yeah, lots stuff. of research. Patrice did a lot of that research. Hi, Patrice. And, um, and of course, it's a very specific topic, and, and I can imagine that, you know, you didn't just randomly run into it. And, and so that is very specific when you have a, uh, something something to write. Yeah, I should clarify. I found it interesting right away. Oh, yeah. It just it yeah. wouldn't have occurred to me to write it. Um, I can imagine that. It could, oh. have, it could have been a two-hour opera, but it's, it's only a 70-minute opera. We had to edit. So you, you almost wrote a two hours opera and then you, you had to cut it or, or you no, knew we, that you we had cut, to... we cut down the text so that it would fit the chamber opera right. category. Yeah, as we know, uh, as you, I mean, especially you know better than me, that, that little text takes a long time. So, mm -hmm. you know, opera libretos are way, way shorter than, than plays altogether otherwise and and michael in your case give me a, a case in which you um how how would it be a, a situation in which you compose something just out of the will of composing it anything i mean nothing has to be um, or anything. I, the only the kinds of things that i do just for my own enjoyment are honestly non-classical um they are or, uh, I don't know, folk songs or pop songs or country songs or, or, or something like that. Um, and the stuff that I do that's either art song or uh, opera is usually in collaboration with some individual or opera company. Um, the one thing that is, I guess, a little different for me is that I'm a composer and a lyricist and so I quite often resort to doing my own work and it's a real good thing for me because I, I'm inspired by, by poetry or words per se I am more inspired by character, characterization. And for example, um, there's a, a song cycle that I've written that has, the premiere has been delayed by, by COVID, uh, but it's a song about, that was commissioned by um, um, a, a soprano named Darcy Bultimer. And she lives in South Dakota and it's a song about Darcy and her favorite horse, and 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 a ho you know, her her the horse that she loves, and and it's so it's a song cycle about fundamentally about women and their relationship with their horses, um, and there's not a whole lot of existing text on that subject, and so it was better for me to write my own text, and I think we used one existing text, but. Other than that, uh, they were texts that I simply made up after kind of getting to know her and her and her uh, and her favorite horse. <laughs> so um, there, there's a, you know someone who who wants me to write uh, something for tenor and trombone and piano, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there's going to be not a whole lot of inspiring text about tenor about trombone. Like like existing poetry about trombones, there's probably some, but I fully expect to have to write my own text about trombones, uh, and that's okay. perfectly okay, and 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 I'm just part of the fun. Uh, for but me. but uh, someone commissioned to do a tenor trombone piano, at, but and, and you choose that the theme will, I mean, the topic will be related to to trombone because you can just take it as a obligato instrument or part of the character, but not necessarily a part of the theme. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are way, different ways to, to go about it, but I, I think I'm going to uh, primarily 
try to get inside the, the psyche of a trombone player or what people perceive the psyche of a trombone player to be. <laughs> so uh, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it's just, it's that this is something that's way in the uh, conceptual stage right now. But, um, you know, uh, most, a lot of the world, a lot of the music world is pe people who combine music and lyrics. Uh, it's just a little bit more unusual in classical music or art song or opera. But it, but I'm not, I'm certainly not the only example of it. I mean, uh, there are plenty of other ones. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Ricky Ian Gorman coming to, 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 to mind initially. And uh, of course, there are, many, there are many people in musical theater, uh, you know, Sondheim and the list goes on and on of people who do that. So it's not, it's not uncommon. It's just a little uncommon in opera. Now, but I studied. I studied with Carlisle Floyd, who was, uh, uh, and I studied with him very, very advised, very on purpose because he was a he's a composer and a librettist, and I wanted to learn how to be a better composer and librettist. So that's why that's why I studied with him. Great, great, and certainly we have many famous other cases of librettists, and certainly you started with Wagner will be the. The, the bigger in, in the opera, and but Menotti was also a great mm -hmm. librettist. And in fact, Menotti wrote a lot of librettos without writing the music, uh, which was uh, which is even more unusual, I would say. Um, but but that is it gives you certain. I mean, it, it's all liberty of of creating, really getting to the word. Although although I assume Jody, you will, as you said, you are you are very involved with the shaping of the lyrics, even if it's pre-written, right? I mean, you right. will. And I have, I have a song cycle in process right now uh, that uh, it's going to be seven poems of Rainer Maria Rilke, uh, who of course wrote in German. And I'm not particularly interested in writing a German song cycle. Uh, I, I want the words to be in English and I wasn't particularly happy with any of the existing translations um, so I'm writing my own translation. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that that's like sneaking in the back door of writing your lyrics is is setting your own translation of something that's originally in another language. But that's been that's been a new experience for me and, and one that I'm enjoying. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, in a way, you would be the lyricist because you would make the word choices right. based on some idea in I mean, of course, you will choose the, the imaginary of the of, of Rilke, but uh, but it will be your words, which is, and, and then you can always change it right. in any case, right? Yes, and, it's, um, it's, so, um, it's been a new experience to be in the middle of a song and uh, and be able to manipulate the language to fit what I want to do musically, rather than trying to find a musical way to, like, to best illuminate the existing text. Right. You'll be a different uh, to it soon. Yeah. What's that? It did give me a little, like a little rush of power in the moment that it happened. I was like, "Oh, that was easy." <laughs> so you may be right, Michael. And and uh, and, and let's talk about that since we're the, the relationship between music and text. And, and how is that? How how is it relate? I mean, I I can give you my own answer, but I want you guys to answer that. So, how is the relationship between music and text? Uh, it's like an age-old question, I think. Okay. Yeah, because it, it, it differs so much from from composer to composer. There's, I mean, Mozart is on record as saying that the text must be the obedient daughter of the music. Um, and it should also be said that maybe songs aren't really his art form. <laughs> he wrote them, but they're not the they're not what we think of when we think of, of his his best writing. Um, I don't know. There are all those leader composers who wrote a tune, and then, like, I think Mendelssohn is is famous for this. He he will just recycle words until he runs out of tune. But I think that's not my personal approach. I think I, I write in a really text forward way. Um, and and it, what does that mean? Uh, it 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 matters to me that the music. Music makes the text easier to understand. Like word emphasis matters a lot to me. Um, 
and and then the like the narrative voice of the speaker so if there's irony or sarcasm in the text or if i suspect that the words aren't really meant to be taken at face value that changes the setting right and, and michael well i hate to admit this publicly <laughs> but i don't like music without words oh same. You like you didn't like what I don't like music without words. I, I see. And um, uh, I, since it's over, I can profess to this. Um, um, I did not listen to any Beethoven during the Beethoven year. Um, that's how that's how strongly I feel about it. Um, and I, I just, I just, they, they go together, hand in glove, or in such a way for me that I simply can't get inspired to write music without words. And words have just this innate rhythm uh, and meaning that are just so useful to, to, to inspiring music that I just can't do it any other way anymore. Um, I, haven't, I haven't written a pure instrumental piece in, uh, since the middle 90s. And I think if somebody asked me to write one today, I would probably say, find another composer. <laughs> it's, just, it's just gotten that, I, I feel that strongly about it. Now, it's not that I don't think that operas should have, shouldn't have instrumental parts, purely instrumental parts. I think that, that those are very important, but they're very inspired by character, by uh, setting, by uh, Seen by what's going on in the show, so I, I think I, I, so. Don't get me wrong; there, there's a place for instrumental music in opera, um, but it, it's very defined by drama. And uh, definitely, the um, uh, text has, for to me, three layers. First, the sound of it. So the uh, the uh, the prosody, which is the, the speed, the length of certain syllables, so the cadence, uh, the inflection of the words, the, the direction of, of the word. Uh, so, so the sound of it uh, is, is one element. Then the other one is the, the meaning of it, the pure uh, meaning of the concept that especially, of course, it's easier to understand in, in nouns, verbs, or adjectives. Everything has its own meaning, even articles and prepositions. And then the emotional meaning of a word. So the, the content, uh, the, the feeling of a word, and certainly that it is very much affected by the situation and the, the, the character situation. So how um, do, do you, how do you relate to those elements? As, any of those that is not important to you, or all of them is important, or, or how do you um, relate to that element? Let me go. Let me ask. Let me let me ask you a question in return. Yeah. Um, if you are describing an omelet, there are eggs, butter, cheese, vegetables, meat, whatever in it. Mm -hmm. You don't. You don't. Take them. You don't take those elements and eat them separately, except in a goofy, fancy restaurant where they're trying to deconstruct the omelet for you. And uh, you know, but you, you you meld them all together. And so uh, I don't know whether you agree with this, Jody, but I, I I think they're they're all they're all melded together in this omelet where they're not really. Um, uh, it's, you know, one one bite of the omelet, you might taste the 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 Iberico ham that's in the omelet, and then another bite, you're you're going to taste the cheese, and then another bite, you might taste the, the vegetables or the butter. And so, certain elements will come to the fore, but the whole omelet nest is always there. And so, it's really hard to separate out the elements, even though some elements may come more to the fore at certain points of time in the music. I think that's a great way to put that. I, and I would add to that, that I am sometimes very impatient with vocal writing that is, is clearly 
only about the sonic, like the sound of the voice and ignores the way that language functions and language has to be everything to us, right? Like it's, we elevate it when we put it to music and we, we make it longer than it would be spoken and, and we bring out certain things about it, but then we go out after we're done with rehearsal and we order a tuna sandwich in the same language. So it has to be functional. And, and honestly, I think that, that my favorite vocal writing preserves at least some element of the function as well as being beautiful because then it feels like language to me and it doesn't feel arbitrary, like a vocalese. I don't like songs that feel like a vocalese. Because uh, as you can say, I mean, we can, we can sing with our words also. That's, that's uh, right. Right. Yeah. And uh, I, mean, I, uh, I sometimes like actual vocaleses, but if there is text, I want to be able to hear the text. Uh -huh. And um, what, what uh, also, so asking because you know you can certainly write a tune, like a tune that is not that is not related directly to the text or not at all, uh, or or make no tune, just a melody but not a tune, which is a bit of a different concept. Right. And um, and I always say that if you change. The music, you will change the character. You will change how the character feels and how the character behaves, right? I can, if you write it fast, I mean, as simple as if you write it really fast, it's much different behavior as if you write it really slow. Uh, how do we, I mean, I, I know that's kind of very specific, but uh, in your in your creative process, how do you, uh, how do you make, relate to those elements i mean you're always commenting as a composer right like it's impossible to set any text your own text or someone else's text to music without giving away something about how you feel about what's happening and and if you're if you're a singer and a pianist who's interpreting interpreting someone else's song that's part of it too you look at the poem but um, and, and one of my favorite games as in my, when I'm wearing my pianist hat is to look at, at uh, different settings of the same poem, like Schumann and Wolf and, and Korngold all writing Das Berlass in a Mechtlein about, about the very, very sad girl whose boyfriend is cheating on her and she just wishes the day was over and how, how those settings are so different. Like you hear the composer as a commentator really strongly. And and in some settings are more successful than others because the composer does a better job at you know at giving us their point of view. Okay. Good. I don't know. Am I saying it right? Oh yeah, yeah. It, 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 and and of course that the the success of the competition is also relative to what you what the audience expects in a way. Uh, I talking about. Wolf, I, I, I adore his style, so I think he's very successful uh, as compared with other composers that will not tell who, uh, that I don't think they're successful because they don't, they don't serve the text well. They're great musicians, but they're not good text setting. So, and to me, uh, text is very important, yet I always say that really the music is the actor. So, because if I change the music, as you say, we change the actor, uh, and and that is a you know constant, constant process. I'm sure for you guys, right? That how how much the text is the actor and how much is the music the actor. Um, um, when you guys write opera, that is very different from a song in terms, definitely in in length. Um, what is, the, what is the, a, a different consideration uh, doing, doing an, uh, yeah, just, just, that, just answer that, whatever it is. What's the different approach to write a, a three-minute song to a 90-minute opera? I think the most important thing when writing opera is that it should not be boring. Um, yeah. And my, I, the, the the one the one the corollary to that is that 
thou shalt write as little recitative as possible. Um, I mean, I've uh, written, as you know, um, this opera about speed dating that practically eliminates recitative from the entire structure. And, and I think composers in the 21st century have um, overrated the capacity of the audience to follow a story uh, through music and that we have to be very, very succinct. Um, and um, there are composers who have used recitative extensively, uh, almost to the extent where they don't write anything but recitative. And that is, to me, a, a recipe for having your work be on the shelf most of the time. And so for me, I'm just extremely careful about wanting to uh, write not just arias, but, but ensembles, um, uh, you know, ensembles and arias and, and pieces, pieces that, that I guess my, my favorite opera is the, the opera comique version of Carmen. And um, that's a perfect example of a piece that's got, you know, arias, ensembles, two week trios, duets, and the like. And that to me is the, the structural model that I like to pursue. I'm simply not um, capable of writing um, in Wagnerian or, or Straussian kinds of structures. I just don't get it. Um, Every time I go to one of them, I disappoint myself. I, I keep, I keep, I go to them and go. I'm gonna figure out why I, why I should like this, and then I end up, you know, not liking it as much as I should. I'm going to have a breakthrough on this. I want to, because I want to. I, I can't, I, I can't believe that that thousands of of audiences and music critics and musicians can't be wrong about this. This, and so I've got to figure out um, why. Um, um, I don't know why why people like Electra, you know. I, I mean, so I'm I'm, I'm going to figure that out someday, you know. And or 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 why or or or, or the real power of an experience like a you know a Rheingold or a Gotthard Amarone or something like that. So, but until I can figure that out for me as an audience member, um, I'm I am going to be stuck writing in more um, um, numbers opera formats. And I'm kind of radically conservative that way. Um, I, I will admit that. Um, but, you know, it, <laughs> it's working for me. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in a it ain't broke, so don't fix it phase about that. Great. That, that, and and in, in that style, of course, uh, in the constant recitative, I mean, I know it sounds like like very unusual, but Electra, as you said, but but also as we say, Falstaff and Tosca are constant recitative for, for the most part. So, but but also uh, when we go to very modern pieces that are very much uh, set pieces and they're very very successful too. So it's not that if you know the very small move as to uh, this constant recitative, they also keep us. As, as you as you said, there are many composers that choose the 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 set pieces formats that, that, that still happen in 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 you know modern opera. Uh, uh, and and Jody, what's your yeah uh, yeah uh, yeah? I, I'm, I'm I'm surprised to hear you use the term or recitative uh, in the context of Verismo because um, I, I I think Puccini does a really good job of of practically eliminating recitative. I mean, uh, you know, in an in an in an opera like Bohème or Butterfly, yes, there are lyrics and things like that that are that there, there are there are moments where the plot is is, is you where where recitative like elements are. But I think uh, Puccini's use, for example, of constant use of melodic elements um, helps really really helps us um, minimize that feel of of. Of recitative. So I guess I guess what I what I what I maybe to be clarifying is that um, you know for example the 
let's let's go back to the the, the dry rest of the team of, of Mozart or, or Rossini. Um, you know, the, the audience in that period of time wasn't really supposed to pay that much attention to that. I mean, culturally, historically, that was the period of time where people were just, you know, kind of taking a break mentally. And, um, uh, and so those, those recitatives were, in a way, structured for people to pay less attention to them. And so we don't want to actually glorify or raise up the value of those kinds of things um, artistically, because um, uh, I don't think they were, they were designed for us to pay that careful attention to them. And whenever I see a production, um, people arguing over, oh, we need to put all the rest of the teeps back into Barrow with Seville, I, I just, I just, I just like, you know, as if someone who used to run an opera company, I go, well, Jane, Jane who gives me $5,000 is not going to be very happy to have to sit through all those rest of the teeps. Um, you know, uh, and so I was always very, you know, adamant about wanting to cut that sort of thing out uh, whenever, whenever I could. Um, now, I don't know what, um, you know, um, and I, so anyway, that's, 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 I'm sorry, I've, I've gone on too much and we, I should look. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that, that, that's exactly what we want to, we want to experience your creative process. That is exactly what we want to, uh, we want to share uh, with, with the audience because there is a very rare opportunity that we get to, to talk to a, a composer and an opera composer uh, of any or a composer of any kind and, and find out exactly how the the mystery of creation is happening so this is fantastic i mean it's really it's really fun and and jody how do you deal with with the difference of um song i'm, I'm and... gonna call myself a moderate on this particular topic okay so i okay let's go back to puccini for a minute the first act of Bohem, where like the first thing that happens is we meet all of these, you know, like young artists, right? These starving guys. And it's meant to be funny. And I think the first act of Bohem is funny in a lot of places. And, and I also think that Michael's really right that that, like that is almost nothing but recitative. Um, if the poor baritone wants an aria and, and excerpts Chonard, I mean, basically that's all it is, but it's also a really great tune. And maybe you could say that in Puccini's case, everything is received. It just all happens to be beautiful. And, and you choose the chunk of it that you want to present as a standalone number, as an aria. And, you know, so I like, I like recitative that is, um, doesn't run on forever. It's, it's connective tissue that gets you from one place to the other, but it doesn't belabor the point. Um, I think that there's a place for spoken text in 21st century opera uh, in places where just putting it, putting it to pitches is going to make it go on longer than it needs to and draw more attention to itself than it needs to. So I think like a mix of, of, of sung recit and, and spoken words is, is good. Um, yeah. I'm, and, I'm writing. Um, I'm writing what's hopefully going to be a comic opera right now, and and, and sort of grappling with that. But it it is true that um, the, the the sooner you get to another tune, the happier your, your audience will be. Okay. And, um, and also, you know, I like in, in modern opera, um, having having an aria that will easily excerpt is probably a good idea, because otherwise. You know who's going to hear your who's going to hear your piece. Okay, and and uh, how do you, you know both of you? How do you know a piece is not boring? Um, I, hey, that's a, that's it's right. I, it's subjective. Yeah, right. I mean that's a you know it when you see it. Um, uh, I no. I will say that post COVID. COVID, um, I think there is a move to, for audiences to want things that are a bit shorter. Uh, I, I think our attention span and tolerance for three-hour evenings in the theater has gone down a bit, and it may go back up. But uh, right now, I think the preference is for things to be a little bit more on the short side. I, I admit, 
I have a fairly short attention span. I have a I have that three to five minute attention span, which is the approximate range to time of a popular song. So I have a shorter than average attention span, uh, and I, I'll admit to that. And, and Johnny? I like things to change in an opera, um, and I, I do pay a lot of attention to, like, like does the key change? Does the texture change? Does uh does the like the the instrumentation of the voices change i think all of that can help keep interest going um it helps if the if the libretto is witty if it's supposed to be a comedy it helps if the story is something that you care about if it's a drama or a tragedy it, it's, and, it's storytelling I, how do you quantify storytelling right 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 and and, and effects and, and so you and you guys play the, the whole piece and 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 figure out when you get bored or or when you when when you are interested or this is too abrupt or it needs more that's an um, interesting yeah that's an interesting process question morgan um uh, for me i have to play things over and over and over and Part of my learn my process now involves demoing everything, making uh, recordings of it, uh, and listening to it, and then kind of figuring out, okay, well, where could I? Where, does this idea need to be amplified some, or shortened some? And then, um, you know, that can extend out to a period of 25, 30 minutes. Um, examining the pacing of something because um, in, in a good drama you know a bohem being a good good example of something that works well in the theater or Johnny Skiki um, you know there's never a dull moment and what, what you want to strive for is never a dull moment uh, and um, it is a subjective thing um, but it does involve listening and listening and listening and listening uh, and interacting with the piece in that way for me. Uh, I, I really consider demoing to be part of the compositional process. And I, I think there's, like, there's a difference, right, between a dull moment and a quiet moment. There's absolutely oh, yeah. places for quiet moments in opera. And I think what makes a quiet moment really, really you know, special for me or something I want to listen to is does it tell, does it really tell me more about the character that I didn't know before? And we could, we could go back to that, that really stylized idea of Baroque opera as recitative, the, like the thing that, that makes everything happen. And then we get to the aria and the aria is an examination of an emotional point of view at length. Right. And, and as we move, through the history of opera into modern opera, those things fuse, and that doesn't necessarily become entirely true anymore. But, but I I like the idea of an aria as as something that that could move the plot along, but it also could just tell us something we didn't know before about that character. Great, and um, and let's say that that uh, let, let, let me give you. A, Actually, give me uh, uh, an example of a successful opera commission come to fruition, and how was the whole process for you, for each of you? Well, let me talk about Alice Riley, since it's uh, uh, something that we all did at the Savannah Voice Festival. Yeah. The initial phase of that involved um, first of all, Cheryl telling me that over the phone, I, I was in uh, Montreal at the time, I happened to be on vacation in Montreal, and this first came up, that he didn't want any of those, he didn't want those, any one of those Mozartian playoffs where, like, at the end of uh, the aria, uh, there's 15 minutes, uh, not 50, 15 seconds or 20 seconds of orchestral playoff, um, where if you can contrast that to... Uh, I don't know, a Puccini aria, usually the voice and the uh, um, orchestra and at the same time. Um, 
So he, he, he emphasized he wanted that kind of structure in the, the way that the, uh, the arias were built. And then the lucky thing was is that, uh, you know, Maria threw, threw a book at me, of, uh, sent me a book of uh, ghost stories and said, let's pick one. Um, and the, that's where I learned about the Alice Riley story. Well, that, that process involved looking at some other goat stories that didn't turn out to be good stories for this project. And right now, I, I consider the, that process to be one of the most time-consuming parts of the whole thing. Um, you've got to come up with a subject that works for the commissioner. And I think of the commissioner as a client. The, the condition, commissioner is, is, is it's, like, it's like if you were getting someone to design you a new suit or a dress, a, a ball gown. It, it, it's it, it's got to make the client look great. It, it's, and so it has to satisfy the needs of the, of the client. Um, it has to be within the client's budget. It has to be within the client's um, orchestral resources. Uh, it, has to, it has to have, it has to fit the, the number of characters that the client thinks they can afford. So to me, it's, it's much more that kind of working relationship as opposed to being sent away and Oh, you do whatever we, whatever you want, and we're going to achieve that vision for you. Um, that's just not the real world. And I would even argue that when those op opportunities have arisen um, at the highest level, um, it has actually created problems for those works. Um, I can, I mean, examples like um, the Ghosts of Versailles or um, um, X or. Uh, any of the pieces that, that have been commissioned by large, large city um, New York organizations, um, it's very hard to convert those works past, th th past those initial venues. And in order for that to happen, it usually involves a reorchestration to smaller or or resources, perhaps a shortening of the work. And so it's, I don't know, I mean, it's, it, I mean, I'm not saying that if were that opportunity to arise, I wouldn't take it. But I, but I, I think that um, works like um, Carlisle Floyd's Susanna, which were fundamentally started with at places with the smaller resources, um, it, you can you can take something with smaller resources and then make it bigger. Uh, but it's much harder to take something that was written with large resources and make it smaller. So um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a client relationship that to me um, uh, is a key part of the commissioning process, um, and it's just it's the the most frustrating thing for me is is when somebody tells me do what you want. I don't I you know I I, don't, I that's that's just not giving me enough direction. And and uh, Jody. Again, the, the question is, uh, give us, uh, <clears throat> how, how, uh, how the process of a, of a successful opera commission work for you? Well, I agree with Michael about a lot of things, um, principally that, you know, the, the commissioner should have a really good idea of what they want to accomplish with the piece. And I think that, you know, Seaglass did a really great job of that with with wailing women they knew exactly what they wanted they wanted six women and they um and we we figured out who the who those people would be one of my favorite things about the premiere was that we had um we had descendants in the audience uh which i think is just is just proof that they knew their audience and they knew what they wanted to do with the piece for me as the composer i wanted to give them what they wanted um and and it was luxury casting for this piece. It was beautiful, beautiful voices. But I also wanted to write a piece that would that would have legs and that would work beyond the the original, you know, the original commission. And for me, that means writing in a way that is like hygienic and welcoming to developing singers. 
and my current project is sort of geared toward that as well something that might work really really well as an undergrad you know an undergrad project or a graduate school project because a lot of opera is being done in universities and conservatories right now um and and they want they want interesting and new options that are welcoming to them so thinking about that is is something that that makes me really happy and interested great all right guys thank you so much for for your time it was fascinating to get to know uh how you get from you know from idea to paper and better from idea to paper to stage and to the audience and uh thank you a any any parting words this was fun thank you for asking yep. Yep, thank, thank you for, uh, for focusing on the writing for, for, for part of your series. And um, yeah. so we'll, we'll see you down the road. But I think, I think it, it, is, it is fascinating to, it, it is a world that we, we don't experience because it's so much earlier in the process as the performing that, that we forget that it's happening sometimes. We always think that, oh, it is there. Well, someone there, but it's hard to know how to, what that came to, uh, how did that happen? And it's very important that, that we are aware of, of how could that happen, so. Well, I, I would say though, Jorge, that, that opera is about the singing and the audience comes to hear the singing. And the composers, uh, we composers need to bear that in mind when we write opera. Uh, we get, we, we, what's confusing is that we have all the luck in the sense that posterity may remember us uh, more effectively than singers or conductors or general directors. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, the, the, those, those kinds of jobs uh, live in the moment much more. And, um, but, but even though singers have, have composers have the luck of that potential for posterity, it's always about the singing. It's always been about the singing. That's why the audience buys the ticket. And um, so we need to make the singers look, look good, sound good, feel satisfied in their roles. And that's what it's about. Great. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful way of, of wrapping up. And uh, I will see you later this year. And everyone, thank you for joining. I will see you in, in a couple of weeks and when we talk to more about the voices of the festival. Thank you. Take thank care. you. Thank you, guys.